Amen. If you have a Bible, we want you to get that open. Kids can make their way to Children's Church right now. And Mike, are you going to? Yes, kids, that's you. You anticipated that. And you guys can make your way. Thanks for the leaders that are going down there to do that. We appreciate it. It's Mark chapter 9 is where we're going to start off. We're, we're going through the apostles, and we're looking at the apostle John today. And that is by far, like by great stretch, the most popular um, biblical name in the Bible. At one time, it was actually six million Johns in America. The next closest was James at three million and Thomas at two million. So Johns are like way over the top. So I'm pretty confident this week by asking anyone with the first name or middle name, John, let me see your hand. Oh, see, I like it. This is, I'm proud of it, aren't you? As, what's your middle name? Edward. Edward. Middle name. What is it? Oh, I thought you said Crystal. Hey, I'm fine with that. I was fine. I just need to make sure before I heard Christopher's good. That's good. What is it? Okay, yeah, there you oh, Of course it is. Right, right. All right, so there it is. That's like, that's, this is the most popular probably the most strange personality out of all 12 of them. This is an, there's an odd mix to this John character. Because we talked about his brother last week, James. James and John are the only two with the nickname Sons of Thunder. So they both had this fiery, think of the John that I just pointed out, there's a fiery aspect to him. But what's strange about this character, John, is he also is the one of the 12 that is always depicted in paintings as extremely soft features. The youngest of the 12. And there's a... I don't want to say effeminate, but it is because, like, if you look at the Last Supper, the Da Vinci, the Last Supper, he's the one, he'd be the one on the left, and he's kind of, he's like this in the painting. And in the, what was that horrible movie 15 years ago, The Da Vinci Code? That they were saying that that wasn't actually uh, John, it was Mary. Well, there was reason for that. And I, we may, Ross and I talked about this, summer in youth intern Ross and I talked about this, where um, of maybe doing a Sunday with the Da Vinci, with the Last Supper because of the teaching that's in it. And purposely, John is in this posture, very soft, very Mary-like. It's like Mary holding Jesus. That's why it's painted that way. Because then there's Jesus in the center, right? They're all on the one side of the table, right? We're talking about the same painting. The next character is like this in the crucifixion position. John is like holding Jesus, Jesus, and then we have... So there's this three movement that's spectacular in the painting, but it wasn't just da Vinci. John was painted with these soft features. But don't forget, as we're talking about John today and his soft features, don't forget that he is a son of thunder because he's that too. He really is. If there's a name to be named after John's, this is a good one because the personality is so diverse. It's deep. There's a complexity to John that's pretty great. Do you remember we mentioned that the apostles, you could tell by the painting because of something that's in the painting of who the apostle is? Our Catholic background people know that better than the Protestants do because they're symbols to try to remember. Who knows what that symbol is that is in most all paintings of the apostle John? Some no Catholic in the room can tell us? 
It's an eagle. There's always an eagle somewhere. Can you guess why? He liked eagle soup. Is there any? So John is the, John is the writer of the Gospel of John. He is also the writer of John 1, 2, 3, right? And he is also the author of Revelation. John is the only of the 12 that wasn't martyred. He died in somewhere around 98, uh, 98 A.D. He actually lived a while, died of natural causes. Don't, don't think that he missed, he probably, I'm making this up, you could ask him someday, he probably wished that he was killed earlier on because don't think that he didn't experience suffering. Enormous amount of suffering and abuse in his life that maybe those earlier ones that were killed might have been the luckier ones. That's possible. Like his brother, taken to the sword, as we said, very, very early on. But because he was sent off to that island, and that's where he had the revelation of revelation. So the eagle is the vision, be able to see far off. John was given this revelation from God, this privilege to see ahead, spectacular events that are yet to happen. That's how far off he was able to see. So when you see a painting of John, you'll typically see an eagle somewhere in it for that reason. Some of the greatest statements on love in the Bible were written by John either written and said by John under the inspiration of God or quoting Jesus. It was him. He was actually in his book, right? Do you recall? Matthew, Mark, Luke, pretty similar books. They saw similarly. What's the word for that? Thank you. Synoptic. They see similarly. Matthew, Mark, Luke follow the same pattern. They cover most of the same material. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Then you have John. Where in the world were you? John didn't write things the same. There are things that John didn't talk about that the other three did. There's things that he just thought he'd not mention, things that he did ma- He just beat of his own drum is John. John is a very, very unique of the four. But John in it several times, five times, I think four or five times, mentions, not by name because it's him, so-and-so, the disciples, it's Peter, it's James, and the one whom Jesus loved. He's talking about himself. That's how he referred to himself. I'm the one that Jesus loved. And then you think of some of the greatest statements on love in the Bible. If you pull out 1 Corinthians 13, the famous love chapter, pull that one out, the rest of them, probably by John. We refer to God is love. Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God, and God is love. That's John. For God so loved the world that he gave you. That's, that's John. I mean, you think of some of your greatest statements on love. They are actually from John. Love each other as I have loved you. It's the apostle of love. Oh, there's the feminine features. He had this balance that is spectacular, soft, loving, son of thunder. Like, yeah, enjoy him, but be careful. He does bite. That's John. As we look at John, I just want to mention briefly a couple things about him. In Mark 9, if you took a moment to turn there, in Mark chapter 9, we have an account. Mark 9, 
38. This is an interesting perspective, and it's John talking. This is recorded by Mark. John said, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Jesus says, don't stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterwards speak evil of me. For the one who is not against me is for us, and not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. This is, this is an eye-opening experience for John. John is literally following Jesus. He is, it's Peter, James, and John. He's in that inner circle with Jesus. They have a guy actually proclaiming Jesus that they'd never even heard of. They're like, what in the world is going on over there? I mean, this is, this is mind-blowing for John. Here we are, and we've got this going on out here. What is that about? And Jesus actually responds by saying, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. Like, he's fine. I translate that today very easily and very quickly. Because we get into a theological position that we think is right, and it's us, and we have the convictions to it, and then we have some group out here, these nutcases, that believe weird things, things that, oh, absolutely, that's not true, and there is no doubt that in our mind, we are in this in with Jesus, and they are not, or they're less of us. And we've got to realize that God's work is broader than us. We were in a small town in northern Arizona, just outside of Sedona. It was a small town of Cottonwood for 10 years. We were there, and there was some fun churches in town, and there were several that were just like us, Baptistic in theology. I'm there for 10 years. I'm on a school board, so I'm involved in the community. And if you were to have asked me who are your closest pastor friends in town, without any hesitation, it would have been Frank Navarez, who is really Pentecostal. It would be Jeremy Peters at the Assemblies of God Church, and it would have been Father David at the Catholic Church. How's that? Well, what about those Baptist pastor friends? Uh, we just didn't, I didn't see them. They weren't doing, they weren't, I didn't, I wasn't better for hanging with them. But I was with these others. We did a community worship with the Catholic priest. Me and him, on stage. There are So many conservative evangelicals say, that's terrible, because they believe this, that, yeah, I I hear you. Believe me, I hear you. But you and I, to recognize they're not my enemy. They're sharing Christ. I was looking this week at Joel Olstein's pictures of his house. Have you seen that? Have you Googled that? You might want to do it before the end of the message. It's amazing. I think it's a $17 million home. Wow. Oh, I, I can think theologically. I can say things about this guy. Then our friend Alan was on stage with him at, at Olstein's church. Joel Olstein's brother is a heart surgeon, does a lot with Samaritan's Purse. Our friends at OBGYN does things with Samaritan's Purse. They're on stage with Joel Olstein. We all know who he is, right? The cool hair? Okay. So 
So they're on stage with him and believe the same thing that most of you are thinking about Joel Osteen. Okay, so he's on stage, and, and it's, it's the arena, right? Is that unbelievable? And the cameras, and, but the part they didn't show was the invitation at the end of the service. And my friend, Alan, is there, and he goes, I heard the gospel so clear from Joel and counselors waiting to talk to people as they're coming. He goes, it was like a crusade, and it was a regular Sunday morning. It was literally a peek behind the curtain to say, you know what, but they're do- Shh, they're not your problem. Stay focused. You and I need to stay focused on the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. And yes, I'm going to stay with some of those basics of the Christian faith that are so critical. But as far as how you baptize, when you baptize, I'm holding to it because that's what we do, and I think it's right according to the Scriptures. But for a church that's not doing that, or they're doing I don't care. How's that? right? We have, we have children in this town, children, countless, going to bed at night afraid because they're going to be abused by a family member. We have it happening in our town by countless numbers. It's happening in our town. But we're going to spend our time criticizing a church because of something they believe. That's brilliant work of Satan to get us all divided about things that ultimately aren't going to make a whole lot of difference. Hey, I'm going to hold to what I believe. I'm not compromising what I believe, but I'm recognizing who the enemy is. And as long as we're all arguing with each other and standing on the high moral ground of theology against others, as long as we keep doing that, Satan's like, beautiful, keep sidelined, keep doing that. And I don't, I don't know how that happened. I, I really don't know how historically they're proclaiming Jesus and Jesus is walking up with people. <laughs> I don't know how that took place. How did they not know? I, I have no idea, but I do know that God's kingdom is much broader than we care to admit that it is. I remember saying to uh, Father David before the event, it was a community thing at his place, and he said, uh, he goes, I want you to speak. And I'm like, oh, okay, Um, can I run by with you what I'm going to (laughs) say? Like, I don't want to start a community, uh, that'd be great in the paper, wouldn't it? That there was like chaos at the community Catholic church because the Baptist uh, preacher and the Catholic priest got in a fight. I think he would have taken me too, by the way, just to throw that out there. I mean, he had this backup of nuns that looked really intimidating. Between him and them, I don't think I would have gotten out of there. I'm just saying that for free. But I remember we were off to the side. I said, hey, uh, Father, what I'm thinking is, and it was just pure gospel. I had this shtick where I was making fun of every denomination in town, (laughs) including us. And the place was laughing. We're laughing at our differences. And then we narrowed down to the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm saying this to him, and he's just staring at me. He's kind of a tall guy and younger than me, and he's just staring and listening. I said, he goes, that's why we want you to talk. That's, that's what we all need to hear. Isn't that fantastic? You think I have theological differences with Catholics? I do, and they do with me. Look at this second point with, I think the love of John, it's broader than we are. It's also love is action. Let me mention this, and we are so out of time, so I'm just going to mention this quickly. The devotional this week, if you're signed up to get a devotional Wednesday, this is the, uh, the topic of it. This is the idea, is love without a verb is useless. Love needs a verb. 
For God so loved the world that he was warm-hearted about mankind. Doesn't do us a lot of good. But for God so loved the world that he gave. Love has to have a verb. Paul spoke of his labor of love. You have to have a verb. Uh, to Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I told you I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. What repetition. All of that to lead to, then feed my sheep, then verb. You love me, verb. So in John, when we see the stories and the teachings that John has collected for us and the examples of John, we're going to see a lot of repetition of a verb. You love your neighbors. Yeah, I'm really warm. I feel warm inside. No, you love your neighbor. Therefore, we give. We buy, we listen, we call, we walk, we help, make, bring, bake, talk, hug, feed, open, play, cry, plan. What have you done with your neighbor? You're really nice to him. I know, we all are. We're nice to our neighbors, mostly. Well, verb, verb. Without the verb, it doesn't do any good. God's endless love for you meant nothing until he attached a verb to it. And the last point there that I would just mention briefly is that love is the distinguishing mark. That is from John also when he said, they will know that you're my disciples by your love. Um, I remember in high school, I always listened uh, on Monday mornings to a talk radio that was a guy named Clay Matthews. He was a, um, a lineman for the Cleveland Browns, and he was just hilarious. So he'd call and make fun of the Browns himself, and he'd talk about the game, and it was just funny stuff. Well, time goes by. And I see in the news Clay Matthews, and I'm like, oh, I want to listen to this guy. And I'm literally watching him and listening to him, and I'm like, just great memories. And, and I went, wait a minute, this is 2015. How old is this guy? Well, it's his son. There's a Clay Matthews, the first, the second, and the third, and they're all football players. And I had a generation go right in front of me. Because I'm listening to this guy and laughing, thinking I was still in high school laughing with him, but it wasn't him. It was his dad that I was laughing with. It's going fast. I am that old guy that says, it's going fast. And the only thing that's going to matter is what we're doing for Christ. Your neighbors are going to come and go. Shirley Shahan was a wonderful woman and she's gone. It goes fast. It keeps moving. Mary Jane keeps moving, doesn't it? 90 years old today. How about that? I love it. I love it. It just keeps going with or without us, right? It keeps going. It keeps going. My encouragement in with John, with the Apostle John, is that we love the way that John talked about love, and the easy way to do it is think, choose your verb. Show love to a neighbor this week with a verb. Just do something. There's a thousand verbs. I looked it up. There's a thousand English verbs. There's a lot to pick from. You're bound to find one that you like. As we celebrate John by loving those around us, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the kindness of leaving us the story in the text of John. Thank you for the stories, the emphasis on love. And I am asking, Heavenly Father, that you would absolutely, through this body, this group, express your love through us in action today and this week more than we have in the past. In Jesus' name, amen.